Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. It really is a great pleasure to be here in Liverpool and to contribute to this series. And since I'm a chemist, I should mention that Liverpool is unquestionably a centre of excellence for this discipline. So what I'm going to try and do in the next 50 minutes or so is to justify this title and to show to you how the discipline of chemistry has a pivotal role in science in general and that it is making absolutely key contributions to the economy, to the environment, and to society in general. So let's just think about chemistry, about what it's all about, and I would argue it's a, it's a tremendously successful discipline. It's developed a very powerful set of tools, both experimental and computational and theoretical, that allow us to understand the structure and property of matters at the atomic level. And I perhaps should say that one huge contribution to understanding matter at the atomic level has been made by the science of crystallography, which is just over 100 years old and which is promoted by the International Union of Crystallography. So we have these incredibly powerful tools to allow us really to probe matter at the atomic level. And then we can use this knowledge, we can use it very effectively to develop and optimise molecules and materials that can benefit for society, for the economy, for the environment and for society. So, <clears throat> chemistry, discipline with huge impact, but it's also, as I say, a pivotal discipline in contemporary science. It, it makes contributions and indeed is integrated with many other key areas of science. I would particularly highlight um, the way in which chemistry is now integrated with molecular biology and genomics. Those, those sub-disciplines wouldn't be possible without chemistry. Material science as well. Materials chemistry is an absolutely integral part of material science, as the fantastic work here in Liverpool uh, shows. But other areas as well, condensed matter physics, mineralogy, and it may surprise some of you to hear that chemistry actually plays a very significant role in astronomy. There's a whole range of fascinating chemistry that takes place in interstellar space. So a discipline that really reaches out almost throughout science. And I want to say a few words about chemistry in the UK, uh, because sometimes people have thought chemistry in the UK may be in a little bit of decline. That's not the case at all. It's a very thriving and successful discipline in the UK, and indeed worldwide, but I think especially in the UK, and that makes very important contributions to economic and societal leads. I'm just going to, uh, if you'll indulge me, just show you a little bit of data to, to, to demonstrate these points. Um, chemistry is now recruiting undergraduates, smart undergraduates, very, very effectively. These are the changes in the total numbers of students studying chemistry at university over the last 10 years. And you see, this is the undergraduates, you see an, an increase in both numbers and in quality. And there's been a modest increase in postgraduate numbers, which we need to encourage. So the discipline is attracting the brightest minds in this country. It's also attracting money. Um, <clears throat> chemists have been very effective at bringing in funding from all kinds of organisations and that again shows the dynamism and success of the discipline. If we look at UK research councils, a slight dip but then it starts coming back. So the discipline is in really good shape. And I'll just say a few words about the famous research um, <clears throat> excellence framework that some of you know a great deal about. I have the privilege, I will call it a privilege, to chair the chemistry panel, the research excellence framework, which evaluates periodically the quality of research in, in fact, all UK universities. <clears throat> now, the REF is quite famous for having a lot, large components of it being incomprehensible, so I thought I'd produce an equally incomprehensible bar chart. But I'll try and demonstrate what this is showing. The, the REF, I'll be, I'll be brief about this, the REF gives what's called a quality profile. It says, and it has four classes, it has what we call four star, which is absolutely world leading quality. It has three star, which is really internationally competitive. It has two star that's still pretty good, but not quite at that level. One star, worthy work, but not uh, <coughs> at the highest level. And if we look at what came out of this REF exercise for the whole of chemistry, in 2014, nearly 30%, nearly 30% of UK chemists who was judged by a pretty tough panel, I can tell you it was tough because Professor Rosinski was on it, 
30% was judged to be absolutely at this world leading level, a big increase on six years ago. Most of the rest was at this international excellent level. And again, an increase on five, six years ago. And the level at the two and one star had declined dramatically. So in fact, UK chemistry had cut its tail. So I'll stop <laughs> on that point. I really just want to make the point, this is a successful discipline in the UK. It's a successful discipline worldwide, but the UK is competing absolutely at the highest level and is then using uh, this expertise to tackle some of the biggest problems which the world faces. So I've produced here a list, which I think few people would dispute, of the really major challenges that are facing the world over the next 50, 100 years. <clears throat> Most of them you'll be well aware of. Carbon, di the carbon dioxide and climate, the very coupled theme of renewable energy generation, environment and resources, food, water, global health. These are absolutely major cha challenges. And chemistry is making absolutely crucial contributions to them all. I won't have time to go into all in detail. For instance, I won't have too much time to speak about the contributions to environment. But chemistry really is making a fantastic contribution to all of these areas. So here's a quotation, in fact, from the former European Commissioner from Research. It says, we live in exciting and challenging times. I don't think anyone would dispute that. He talks about the growing economies in China, India, Russia, and South Africa and how these developing <coughs> uh, economies, developing nations, have an increasingly strong commitment to research and innovation. And that really is true. I was in South Africa and Botswana last week, and those countries are very, very firmly committed to research and innovation, including research and innovation in chemistry. And it also, this, I think, very, very actually incisive, quotation makes the point that if we're going to respond to these challenges, we need a global response and we need research that <coughs> uses the expertise in the globe. Anyway, let's just look at some of these challenges that I mentioned. Uh, they are formidable. Food, nearly 700 million people are food insecure. Energy and climate, we all know about this, but here's a stark statistic that if we go on doing what we're doing at present, uh, we'll have used our entire carbon budget, the amount that's safe to use, by 2034. Earth resources, absolutely crucial to many areas of the economy. Environment, here's quite a frightening statistic. Seven million people died as a result of uh, air pollution. Health, here are some statistics. Problems with TV, problems with HIV. I'll talk later on briefly about problems with anti uh, <coughs> biotic resistance, and then water, again, a very, very major problem. A large millions of people don't have access to water of sufficient quality. So let's just think about, say, how chemistry is helping with these crucial challenges. So I'm going to start by talking about the very coupled areas, renewable energy generation, energy storage, and carbon dioxide utilisation. And first, just a word about climate change. Um, don't let anyone fool you that this isn't happening because it is happening. Very, very thorough and scholarly <coughs> investigations. This is one overview from the Royal Society and the US National Academy of Sciences provide absolutely overwhelming evidence that anthropogenic cl generated climate change is happening. And here's a quote, again, one I rather like from the CEO of Unilever, only by tackling climate change in a systematic way can we hope to deliver growth for the global economy. And um, the cost of inaction, this is a really important point, exceeds the cost of action. Anyway, let's get on to how chemistry is contributing. And first, I'll highlight what we call solar fuels. This is a really exciting development, and like many exciting developments, it draws its concepts from nature. Now, we all know about photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is nature's way of generating solar fuels. We know what it does. It uses the energy in sunlight. It uses water and carbon dioxide to make oxygen and a fuel, in this case, the carbohydrates that are fuels for the plants. 
So photosynthesis produces <coughs> solar fuels. So can we develop artificial photosynthesis? A huge amount of effort by chemists and material scientists worldwide in this endeavor to take carbon dioxide, to use solar energy, to develop carbon-based fuels, and of course, to as well, to develop essentially hydrogen as, as a fuel by splitting water. So <coughs> these technologies are now within grasp, and they're within grasp because of the contributions of chemistry. And we can integrate them with these new technologies, with existing technologies. So to develop <coughs> these um, carbon CO2-based fuels, we can take carbon dioxide, uh, produce exactly, for example, from power stations. We can then use this technology to convert it into fuels, but also into carbon-based materials that I'll talk about later. Now, let me just give you one example. I could take many, many examples, but this is one I'm familiar with. It's work of a very good colleague at UCL, Zheng Wang Tang, in the chemical engineering department, who's done some really innovative materials chemistry both to develop improved ways of splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen and also in activating CO2. And let me just show you some of the things he's trying to do. Um, he's taken his inspiration from photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is incredibly clever and one of its tricks is to separate the oxygen generation, oxygen evolution, from the hydrogen evolution, and then to transfer electrons between them. And he has managed to develop technology, uh, science that will do that as well. So he has an oxygen evolution catalyst and a hydrogen evolution catalyst. He uses urea. Uh, for the hydrogen photocatalyst, he uses <coughs> in these oxide materials for the oxygen uh, evolution photocatalyst, and it really works, published in a very prestigious journal, but then highlighted by uh, this journal, C and EN News. So that's really innovative chemistry that's responding to this challenge of, of splitting water effectively and efficiently into hydrogen and oxygen. He's also done some wonderful work on activating CO2, essentially converting CO2 into carbon monoxide, which you can then use in subsequent reactions. And here it's really intriguing stuff. He takes what's a kind of composite material involving graphene oxide, that's oxidized graphene, and copper oxide. And what he shows is that the interface of these two materials, you get very, very effective <coughs> activation of CO2 uh, by sunlight. So again, this is really, really nice, clever chemistry and material science. So innovative chemistry that's responding to a really major challenge. So let's now go on. I've already started in my second topic, and that's carbon dioxide utilization. This is a very, very major challenge in contemporary science, and I think it's a, it's a challenge to which chemists, contemporary chemists, including many in this country, including people, scientists at Liverpool, are corresponding, are responding to. And we should actually distinguish two things. The first is taking carbon dioxide and converting it to fuels that I've already talked about, and I'll come back to. The second is taking carbon dioxide and converting it into materials. A very large number of the materials we use are carbon-based. So let's use carbon dioxide as an asset to develop carbon-based materials. Now, I'm going to give you one or two examples. The first is a piece of work that I was involved in, but I should say this work was very much led by Nora DeLue, now at Cardiff, and Alberta Rolden and Nathan Hollingsworth. And this <coughs> used iron sulfide materials to convert CO2. And it was a really neat piece of work. <coughs> I can say this because I didn't make a big contribution, uh, because it used, again, inspirations from biology. What it was able to show is that this mineral presents a similar structure, a mineral called grigide or sulfide, to the active sites found in many modern-day enzymes. So it used that as its inspiration, then synthesized these sulfide, these grigite particles, and showed that they could quite effectively um, 
convert CO2 into useful chemicals. Now, there's a lot of work, I say, worldwide on this topic, uh, in particular reacting CO2 with hydrogen. If we can do that, there are a whole range of very useful products we can make. We need a source of hydrogen, we need energy, but we need to be able to do this kind of chemistry in a sustainable manner, and if it's going to be useful, it has to be viable, we have to scale it up, and we'd have to get the chemistry happen happening at an acceptable rate. Let's go back, though, to this work, because it... It, it not only has relevance to converting CO2 into something useful, but it also actually has relevance uh, to the origin of life. Um, so let's just think about these phenomena here. These are what are called alkaline hydrothermal vents. They are found at the bottom of various oceans. And what they do is they, from these vents, we get large amounts of really quite hot water coming out, alkaline water, and it's sulfurous. So around them, you get accumulation of sulfide materials. Now, let's just go over now to the right-hand side. If we look at this enzyme, enzymes are biological catalysts. This enzyme is, again, very effective at the kind of chemistry we're talking about, changing CO2 into useful molecules. And in the centre of this enzyme, there's a little cluster of iron sulfide. And that little cluster of iron sulfide looks rather like the surfaces of some of these sulfide minerals. And that's led to speculation that these hydrothermal vents could have played a crucial role in the origin of life because the signature of these sulfides is found in current day enzymes. So really fascinating stuff. So here we see this is the surface of this sulfide material. This is the arrangement of atoms. Yellow is sulfur. And here is the same arrangement of atoms that we see in these enzymes. So we know the enzymes do the trick. So the team doing this work said, well, let's see if this mineral that's got a similar arrangement of atoms, if that will do the trick as well. So at first they went out and used some very elegant chemistry to synthesize these Grigite, this iron sulfide in a nano structure where it's going to be particularly active. They use computational chemistry to look at how the CO2 would interact with the surface of these sulfide particles, and they found that these carbonate species, which are derived from the CO2, were very effective at binding to the surface, provided the pH, the acidity was just right, and then they were able to show that this really worked that it would convert CO2 into a whole range of interesting products, formic acid, <coughs> methanol, and this one here with a two carbon atoms, pyruvic acid. So this really works. Now, this at present is proof of concept. So it shows that this kind of chemistry can be used to convert CO2. It also gives insight support, or at least feeds in, to this origin of life discussion concerned with hydrothermal uh, vents. Right, so let's get a little bit of local talent here. Here is some beautiful work uh, done by this guy, Alex Cowan. Thank you very much, Professor Rosinski, for letting me have this slide. Again, this is converting CO2, in this case, to what is called CO and H2, syn what is known as syngas, a mixture of CO and H2. It does it electrolytically. It has this rather beautiful catalyst here, which is a composite of a carbon nanotube and this uh, inorganic complex here, and it really works. It will convert CO2 into this very important <coughs> gas here, syngas, which you can then use to make fuels, and it will do it efficiently and effectively. So a beautiful bit of chemistry uh, from the team here. Let me now go on to another example of using CO2. We talked about using CO2 to make fuels. Now, as I said earlier, we can use CO2 to make useful materials. And I think one of the nicest illustrations of this kind of chemistry is from Charlotte Williams. Very, very elegant chemistry. Charlotte is currently at Imperial College, just about to move to the University of Oxford. And what she does is she takes these molecules here, known as epoxides, she reacts them with carbon dioxide. She uses a catalyst, and she can then convert convert the CO2 and the epoxide, they're linked together uh, to form a polymer, and a really useful polymer as well. And it's a wonderful 
uh, catalytic chemistry. I'll say a few words about catalysis in a minute. You can you do this chemistry using fluid glass, gas from power stations. Uh, it has reduces greenhouse gas emissions. You get controlled polymerization. This is really very effective and elegant chemistry. And here's the catalyst, which was developed and designed uh, by Charlotte's uh, team. So there is really very clever chemistry that's being used to take CO2, a pretty useless molecule generally, and, and convert it into a useful polymer. So there's carbon dioxide converted to materials. And the catalysts are extremely effective, they're robust, <coughs> extremely good for this kind of polymerization. And actually, just a word before I go on about catalysis. We'll see catalysis coming up time and time again in this lecture because catalysis is one of the most important areas of contemporary chemistry. Catalysis allows this kind of chemistry to happen. It promotes uh, chemical reactions. And Charlotte has built on this work to develop really sophisticated polymers, again, reacting a whole range of molecules with CO2 uh, <clears throat> to make what we call block copolymers, which have different kind of chemical functional groups arranged along the polymer chain and have different functionalities. This is really beautiful work again, patent applications and published in the best quality scientific journals. So here is beautiful quality chemistry at the service of, <coughs> service of society by producing new materials. So that's CO2. Let's now move on to another very, very big challenge and that's energy storage and I'm going to talk here about both batteries and fuel cells and in particular I'm going to highlight the work of Saifel Islam, a very good colleague uh, from the University of Bath. Now we need to be able to store energy, okay, we perhaps can, uh, we, we'll be able to generate energy using sunlight but we need to be able to store it and batteries are essentially energy storage systems <clears throat> and we need to be able to store uh, we need to store energy in small electronic devices such as our mobile phones and laptops and in fact mobile phones and laptops have been made possible by innovations in chemistry we need if we're going to have electric cars we need to be able to store energy in batteries on a much larger scale and then we're going to be able to need to store energy uh, <clears throat> for the grid for example, energy generated by wind and solar power will need to store that on a very large scale. And the field of battery technology is responding to that, and it depends, this whole field of developing more effective energy storage technologies depends on materials performance. Materials performance, as we say here, is at the heart of green technologies and materials chemistry in particular has an enormous challenge to develop to improve materials for real world applications. Right now we know this field is developing well there are electric cars here are examples and they do sell but there are limitations uh, they don't have particularly long ranges and at present they're very expensive so we need to do something about that we need to be able to develop new batteries and what we need are batteries that are light <coughs> and small and here are some traditional batteries this is the lead acid battery uh, which we still got in our cars which is neither light nor small uh, but we move up this scale here to lithium ion batteries which have been the subject of a huge amount of research in this country and worldwide but we have some of the leading figures in this field in the UK so lithium ion batteries are both in fact um, <coughs> both light and small so they have a great deal going for them and I want to look, now look inside a lithium ion battery because it's based on really neat chemistry chemistry that was pioneered by this fantastic scientist John Goodenough. In fact, I was around as a PhD student in Oxford when this work was going on. I don't think any of us realised the impact it was going to have. It's really very nice chemistry. <coughs> what happens during the discharge of your battery? What you have here, one of your electrodes, your anodes, you've got lithium inside graphite. The other, you have this cobalt oxide materials. And when the battery discharges, the lithium loses an electron which goes around the circuit. That's what 
powers your mobile phone and those lithium ions slip across and they slip between the layers of this cobalt oxide. So that was solid state chemistry pioneered by John Goodenough. It's had the most amazing impact. These types of batteries, they're what are inside our mobile phones. They are what are inside our laptops. They've made the change in lifestyle that portable electronic devices have made, the huge change in lifestyle that has been enabled by this chemistry uh, pioneered and discovered by John Goodenough. But, terrific stuff, there are problems. There are problems with this cobalt oxide system, problems with cost, safety and toxicity. And there's a huge amount of effort developing new materials, manganate materials and iron phosphate materials. Let me just say a word about the iron phosphate materials. Here they are, for those for the crystallog, those who are interested in crystal structures, here's the structure of this compound determined by crystallography promoted by the IUCR. It's a lovely structure for people who like them. And again, it was discovered, pioneered by John Goodenough, for whom I have such an enormous um, admiration. Um, if we're going to understand and optimise these materials, we need to understand how the lithium ions move in them. And a beautiful contribution has been made here by Saiful Islam. He shows that the lithium ions kind of move on this curved zigzag path. That's a low energy path which allows them to find their way through this crystal structure. So this is computational chemistry that I spend a lot of my time doing beautifully employed in revealing how this crucial process of ionic motion takes place in this system. And in fact, we can see here how the lithium ions snake their way through uh, this crystal structure. Uh, and really, very nicely, that was a prediction from computer modelling made about 10 years ago. And then a few years after, people carried out, again, very clever crystallography using neutron techniques. And they were able almost to map these lithium ions as they moved along this channel. And the distribution of the lithium ions along this channel was just as predicted uh, by Saiful Islam's calculations. But the quest for new materials continues. Uh, we looked at phosphate materials. And again, this group, Islam, again, Peter Bruce, a real world leader in this field, are exploring new mat other materials. For example, this lithium iron silicate, just the kind of system you want, because we can make it, as it says here, from rust and sand. So chemists are really using their expertise to develop these new materials that we need, <coughs> sorry, we need for this technology. And then just finally, one of the most exciting possibilities for this whole area of lithium ion batteries is that we could just use lithium reacting with air. And what you can see is you can do that, the capacity of your battery increases enormously. You could put, if you could really get, the, can get this technology to work, you could get batteries in cars that had ranges of over 300 miles. And work here in Liverpool is contributing to this field of lithium air batteries. Right, just a final point here. What about sodium ion batteries? Lithium, unfortunately, is not that common an element. So we may need to explore other elements. And again, a great deal of work being done worldwide, including in the UK, on <coughs> sodium ion batteries, similar to lithium, but they have a larger mass, but they're abundant and low cost. And this technology probably will be used in grid storage for renewables. Now, just a few words about solid oct about fuel cells. Fuel cells are the kind of cousin of batteries. What we do in a fuel cell is really, instead of burning a fuel, we <laughs> use the reaction to generate electricity. And fuel cells have been around for well over 100, but probably about 150 years. But <clears throat> really will be absolutely crucial to future energy, to our current and future energy technologies. For example, in combined heat and power uh, systems. <clears throat> now again, fuel cells make demands on chemistry. 
in particular the electrolyte in the fuel cell. Uh, this is what is used in most fuel cells, this material over here, zirconium dioxide in which we've included yttrium. It's very effective, in fact was discovered by Nernst in the 1890s and still very widely used. Then there are these materials here, rather more sophisticated materials, lanthanum gallate, <coughs> but recently um, various groups, including the Islam group, have started working on an entirely new class of material. The problem with these things, the zirconia, is that they, in fact, are limited. Uh, just a kind of technical point, they work by what we call vacancy mechanisms. Some of the oxygen ions are missing, and that allows oxygen ions to jump through the structure. But <coughs> the rate at which they can jump by that method mechanism is definitely limited, limited. So are there alternative approaches? The alternative approach is to try and put extra oxygen ions in there, and that allows you to get very, very rapid oxygen ion motion, which is what we want for an effective fuel cell. So <coughs> the Islam group and others have worked on this system, this hydroxy appetite system, but in fact I'm going to come back to later on in a completely different context. And both experiment and theory show that these could be very, very effective for transporting oxygen and therefore for electrolytes, for fuel cells. And let me now, though, go back, sorry I skipped there, again to some of the beautiful work that is going on here in Liverpool. This was work led by Matt, who's here in the audience, published in Science a couple of years ago. And this was actually based on computational predictions. They have developed a beautiful procedure which allows you to fit essentially groups, groups of atoms, groups of atoms, kind of motifs of atoms, and you can fit them together, and you can explore different ways in which you fit them together, and then find the best and most effective way. And in, by using this computational technology, they were able to predict a new material, they are good synthetic chemists as well. They synthesize this material and they show that as a fuel cell cathode, it was comparable with the best known systems. So again, really innovative computational experimental chemistry at the service of this technology. So I've said a lot about energy and I'm now going to move on to food. <coughs> and we need food to feed the world, a fairly obvious statement. But let's just again look at some of these really rather stark features. More than 800 million people go to bed hungry. That's a pretty frightening figure, a really pretty terrible figure. By 2050, which is not that far away, global population, which is now somewhere between 6 and 7 billion, will be about 9 billion. So we've got a problem at present, and we're going to have over 2 billion more mouths to feed uh, in 30, 40 years' time. If we're going to solve these problems, we need science. We need lots of different kinds of science, but we need chemistry. And we must recognize that fertilizers, pesticides, have quadrupled agricultural productivity uh, over the last 100 years. And let me just show you here, this is, I think, is quite a stark, interesting, um, striking statistic. What we're doing here is correlating global cereal production with global production of fertilizer. And you will see that the two are very closely correlated. It would have been nice if I put on this graph also that it is an equally strong correlation between fertilizer production and global population. So fertilizer production has allowed this increase in the food supply. And an absolutely crucial component, crucial <coughs> chemical that we need for fertilizer production is ammonia. Now, ammonia synthesis has been around for 100 years. It was discovered by uh, the effective way of synthesizing ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen, discovered by Harbour and then developed further by Bosch, and that is the basis of the way in which we make ammonia today. But there are problems. First, just say the Harbour-Bosch process, wonderful piece of chemistry, Nobel Prize awarded, and <clears throat> ammonia production 40 times more efficient than it was 100 years ago, but there are problems. It is very energy intensive, and ammonia production responsible for getting on for 2% 
of glo global energy consumption. Uh, we use hydrogen produced natural gas. We use react nitrogen and hydrogen directly together. But we need less energy intensive processes. And we need a search for new catalysts. Because it's catalysis that allows this chemistry to take place. And just a word about a project I'm involved in, led though by Justin Hargreaves at the University of Glasgow, which is exploring new nitride materials for ammonia production. So again, we're using our chemical knowledge. So it takes this rather interesting nitride material, a mixture of cobalt. The material contains cobalt, molybdenum, and nitrogen. And what you can do is you can use this to synthesize ammonia. So <clears throat> what we think happens is that the hydrogen essentially pulls nitrogen out of this compound. It actually pulls the nitrogen out to make ammonia. The nitrogen in the compound is depleted, but then we can replenish it by acting by nitrogen reacting with this compound to regenerate the cobalt molybdenum nitride. So it's quite neat. Um, we're doing computational work really to verify this mechanism at present, but the nitrogen and hydrogen are not reacting directly together. The hydrogen is pulling the nitrogen out of this very interesting compound pulling it out and then the compound is being replenished, the nitrogen in the compound is being replenished um, by reacting with nitrogen. And as I say, we're doing both experiments and computation to learn more about this mechanism. We elaborate here. So here's our cobalt molybdenum nitride and here we see it. The hydrogen pulls nitrogen out and then nitrogen N2 reacts with it to replenish the nitrogen in the compound. Okay, so I could obviously say a great deal more about food, but again, if we are going to respond to this enormous challenge, we will need creative and innovative chemistry. So my next challenge is water, and huge problems with water. So I was in Botswana last week, where they've had drought for about six years, and you see the problems it's creating. Interestingly, when I arrived, it started raining, so um, made me quite popular. Um, anyway, there's uh, uh, the problems with water, and no, I shouldn't joke about it, it's a huge problem, is growth and demand, but we need high quality, and we need to eliminate contamination. And that's the latter point that I just want to talk about. And I'm going to describe to you here some actually very simple chemistry that I learned about when I visited the University of Teshpur. Uh, this was uh, uh, end of last year. This is a university, actually a very good university, in Assam in the far northeast of India. And the challenge this is responding to is the problem of arsenic in water. This is a problem uh, that occurs in many places in the third world. It's particularly severe in parts of Assam. And arsenic in your water is extremely bad news. Essentially, arsenic replaces thiols in proteins and it causes all kinds of diseases. <clears throat> this is not a complete list. Cancer of skin, kidney, liver, enlargement of the liver, bronchitis, bone marrow problems, melanosis, dark spots on the chest, it's horrible. And this is really widespread. Um, <clears throat> there are hundreds of millions of people in the world exposed to this problem, tens of millions in India, millions in Assam. And <clears throat> people in this chemistry department, they wanted to do something about this problem. Now, they knew they couldn't use really sophisticated technology because they have to get this technology out into the villages. And this is a pretty, India's a very mixed country, but this is a pretty poor uh, part of India. And what they actually produced was some really rather simple, straightforward chemistry, but it works. And what they do is <coughs> they add iron chloride, very cheap chemical. Uh, they then adjust the acidity, they adjust the pH carefully, and then they then add an oxidizing agent, permanganate. And what that does is it makes sure all the iron, as well as the iron chloride, is oxidized up to make iron chloride, and it oxidizes the arsenic to this species here. And if you get your pH right, the iron chloride starts to coagulate, and then this arsenic species sticks to it. 
and it really works. It's very simple chemistry. Essentially, it's just simply what we call oxidation chemistry followed by precipitation, but it works, and this arsenic species, once you've oxidized it, it sticks to these coagulates and you remove it from the water. And uh, this has been implemented in domestic units and in units at schools. It has saved lives and will continue to save lives. They've also uh, responded to another challenge, and that is, again, a very unpleasant problem of what we call fluorosis. Now, we know in this country we add fluoride to our water because that strengthens our teeth, and we're quite right to do that. But if you've got too much fluoride in your water, it has real problems because the mineral component in your bones, hydroxyapatite, absorbs fluoride and if it absorbs too much, it causes all kinds of problems. And <coughs> this is some of the rather unpleasant examples. It ruins your teeth, it leads to problems with your bones and again, it afflicts a large number of people uh, in India and worldwide, in the developing world. And they, again, have produced some really simple chemistry to respond to this challenge. They said, well, actually, let's make, kind of in situ, this material hydroxyapatite. That is what the mineral component of, of bone, that's what's in our teeth. And we know that that material, in fact, will soak up fluoride. In fact, that's what happens in our teeth. And it can, to a limited if you do it to a limited extent, it will strengthen it, but not if you do it excessively. So what they do is they take really cheap stuff, crushed limestone, calcium carbonate, phosphoric acid, again, very cheap stuff. They throw them together, and you make this material hydroxyapatite. That then soaks up the fluoride. And again, it's simple chemistry, but it really works. The fluoride goes down to acceptable, healthy levels. And it's simple technology. Just these two raw materials, cheap raw materials, which you mix together and it will work to remove fluoride. And again, this simple, cheap technology has been implemented. It's been implemented in houses and it's been implemented in schools. So I found this... There was lots of other beautiful chemistry going on in this department in Assam, but this, I thought, really impressed me. People have used actually fairly basic but ingenious chemistry to start to solve a problem <coughs> that causes all kinds of health difficulties for people in their region. Well, that leads me into my final challenge, global health, and chemistry plays a crucial role here. I can just take one example, and sorry for the spelling mistake, the antimicrobial uh, resistance. Now, I think we all know that antimicrobial resistant is a really big problem. That is drug resistance infections. Uh, it follows from the fact that, of course, bacteria evolve. They evolve to fit their environment, and their environment increasingly in includes um, <coughs> antibiotics. And here's a quote from our Prime Minister, so it must be right. If we fail to act, we are looking at an unthinkable scenario where antibiotics no longer work. And I mean, he is dead right here. This is an unthinkable scenario. Here's another example from the Lancet. New gene that makes common bacteria resistant to the last line antibiotic found in animals and patients. So again, this is potentially quite frightening stuff. But chemistry offers solutions. Chemistry can offer solutions in developing new drugs. We're probably all aware of that, or modifying, rejuvenating old antibiotics. Chemistry actually is contributing to this field in other ways as well. It's contributing in the development of antibacterial materials and coatings. One of my colleagues at UCL, Ivan Parkin, has done very nice work here. So coatings and materials that essentially prevent the spread of infection. It's contributing by developing drug delivery devices for more targeted delivery. But here is just one example. Chemistry's contributions. Here's penicillin, the famous kind of prototype um, <coughs> antibiotic. Here is a recently synthesized antibiotic that will help with killing some of these drug-resistant bacteria. So chemistry will be vital in solving this problem. 
Well, I think I should stop at that. I have two things. First, to thank the people who contributed, who helped me put this lecture together. Royal Society of Chemistry, Saiful Islam, Charlotte Williams, Alberta Rolden and Nora Delu from Cardiff, Matt here from Liverpool, and Robin Dutter from Tejpur, who uh, told me about their work on water purification. And what I hope is, as I say, that this lecture has at least in part, lived up to its title. I hope I've shown you first, chemistry is a very, very exciting discipline. And secondly, that chemistry is responding to these global challenges and that we need innovative chemistry to solve these global challenges. I'll just conclude by saying <clears throat> that I am an optimist. During this talk, I've highlighted some of these really, really severe challenges I think they will be solved, and I think one of the contributions, and key contribution to their solution, will be innovative chemistry. So I'll stop at that point, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs>